UFC fight night, Derek Lewis versus Rodrigo Nascimento just wrapped up. We saw fraud checks. We saw Joaquin Buckley get the biggest win of his career, and Derek Lewis, after five sets of tomfoolery, decided to let a 1-2 go, and he gets it done. And it's time for me to recap this entire card. Overall, I thought it was one of the best fight nights of the year, probably the best fight night of the year. Great energy, an amazing crowd. And on picks, I went 8-4. and four. I started to get worried as we got to the main card, but then we picked back up. We got the last three right. 8-4, and four, pretty decent. Not so bad for old coin flip Tracy. But let's get into this. We're going to recap every single fight. The timestamps are in the description. Let's start with the first fight of the night. JJ Aldrich and Veronica Hardy. I picked Veronica Hardy to get this one done via wizard in her corner <laughs> dan hardy the mastermind himself and you know what she had the speed advantage she was looking fast she was looking crispy and it just seemed like she was beating jj aldrich to the punch third round things got a little bit hairy things got a little bit sloppy she gets dropped uh, almost gets submitted and then gets controlled but she won the first two rounds not a whole lot to take away i think this is kind of where she's getting close to her ceiling but the reason why I always pick her to win her fights is because, and I know this sounds a little bit silly, but in WMMA, where the competition isn't always the best, a Dan Hardy in your corner, where he, he's always obsessing over MMA, he, he loves MMA, he loves the sport. If he's invested in your career, that makes a difference at this level in WMMA. Whereas there are some coaches for WMMA fighters that can be yes men, but either way, Good win for Veronica Hardy. She gets it done. Let's get on to the next one. Jake Hadley versus Charles Johnson. I picked Charles Johnson to win this one. Jake Hadley, I mean, I don't even remember too much of this fight, but either way, Johnson won this fight. I think he got a knockdown in the first round. And he just kind of outstruck Jake Hadley. Showcased some really good wrestling defense. Some really good takedown defense, as he always does. And... Just kind of was beating Jake Hadley to the punch with long one-twos. And uh, that was kind of the story of the fight. Hadley loses in a very close decision. But either way, I think the judges got it right. On to the next one. Billy Goff versus Trey Waters. Fight of the night, 100%, but a robbery. I picked Trey Waters to win this. But I do believe that Billy Goff won the second and the third round. We, right off the bat, one of the best fights I've seen. Billy Goff is the king of imposing his will, the definition of it. He doesn't know how to take a back step. And he's constantly pressing forward, throwing the kitchen sink at his opponents, fighting Trey Waters, who is a guy that has a reach advantage, the way you have to fight him. You just have to get in his face. You got to make him tired. And you got to make it a little bit dirty. And that's exactly what Billy Goff did. As I said, chucking the kitchen sink at his opponent, doubling up on jabs, following up with kicks, Constantly throwing low kicks in between exchanges, just landing a lot of volume. Trey Waters, I believe, dropped Billy Goff in the first round after a close fir first round, after a scrap, took the first round. The second round, though, Billy Goff won the round. I know that there was a big moment where Trey Waters hurt Billy Goff, landed like a five-piece combination, and then had a submission attempt where he almost locked in a, a standing guillotine. But the thing is, he didn't get it. That sequence in and of itself was only 40 seconds. And the majority of the second round was Trey Waters not really throwing anything. Kind of sitting there on the back foot. It looked like he was tiring out. It looked like Billy Goff was getting to him. And Billy Goff was the one that was active, that was landing strikes. There were multiple minutes where Trey Waters would throw like one or two strikes per minute. And I just thought that Billy Goff did enough outside of a 40 second sequence to be able to steal that round. The third round... Billy Goff had like a two-minute exchange where he was pushing Trey Waters up against the fence. And yes, he didn't do anything with it, but Trey Waters couldn't do anything about it. So in that exchange alone, that's a Billy Goff win. But after that exchange, they're back on the feet and Goff is pushing the action. He's moving forward. He's throwing punches and bunches. He's throwing one-twos with a kick at the end of it. And he's landing most of his shots. Every now and then, Waters would clip him with like a big hook while he's moving back and it would land flush and it would look like a really clean strike but even though he was throwing a lot with Goff he was clearly missing half of the punches that he was throwing and when I say clearly like by a mile but for whatever reason despite the fact that Goff 
easily outlanded him and have the two minute exchange where he's pushing Waters up against the fence. They gave this fight to Waters and to make matters worse, they gave Waters a 30-27 on two of the scorecards or at least one of them, which makes absolutely no sense. And I don't understand what the thinking was. What were the judges thinking? Were they just giving it to him because he looked to be the cleaner striker with a little bit more finesse? Because I understand Goff, he had to make it dirty. He looked a little bit sloppier, but he was landing more strikes. And his strikes had impact in the third round. And he clearly won the third. And he clearly won the second. This was a robbery. It was a close fight, but they gave it to the wrong guy. And the 30-27 is ridiculous, all right? So even though I picked Waters, I have to admit, Billy Goff got the shit end of the stick and he should have won this fight. Let's get on to the next one. Terrence McKinney versus Esteban Ribovic. I picked Terrence McKinney to get this one done. I thought he could maybe mix in the grappling. I thought he could land the one twos. And with Terrence McKinney, sometimes it's just a matter of who lands first because he has been knocked out like four times in his career and he gets knocked out again. Maybe this is the fourth time, either the fourth or fifth, but... Esteban Ribovic sets up a nasty flush high kick combination, blinding Terrence McKinney with the right hand, putting the right kick behind it, flush on the chin, knocks him out. Nasty KO for Esteban Ribovic. And he's dangerous. This definitely was a step up in competition for Terrence McKinney since the last couple of guys that he's fought. I think this might even be a career ender. Even though McKinney's probably not going to get cut. I mean, as I said, this is like the fourth or fifth time this guy's been knocked out. And he's in his 20s. He's 29 years old. That's a lot of damage, all right? He's been KO'd by Sean Woodson. He's been knocked out by Drew Dober. He's been knocked out, face-planted by Bonfim. Now by Esteban Ribovic with a flush head kick. When it first landed, I didn't think it was that flush. And I was saying Terrence McKinney, but it actually did land incredibly flush a violent ko just nasty work for esteban ribovich and terence mckinney can't get a break maybe this was his chance to prove himself as someone that could work his way up to the rankings but he gets shut down and let's get on to the next one chase hooper versus Vyacheslav borshev all right now this was one of my most hyped fights for this card and it absolutely delivered even though i got it wrong i picked Vyacheslav borshev you just had to know if Chase Hooper were to get this fight down in the first round that he could take over and dominate. And that's exactly what he did. But the way he took it down was the impressive part. He didn't even shoot a takedown. He set up the perfectly timed overhand right on the button, landing right on the chin of Vyacheslav Borshev, knocking him down. Vyacheslav, to be honest, has always been a little bit chinny. He gets rocked a lot in his fights. I think he got dropped like three times against Nazim Sadikov, but either way, Chase Hooper jumps on him and completely dominates. Gets a 10-8 round, insanely good ground and pound. Just beat the shit out of Vyacheslav Borsev. He had a hematoma at the end of the round. That's how bad the damage was on his forehead. And then with the momentum that Chase Hooper had after the first, I, I think maybe he just mentally broke Vyacheslav, doing so much damage to him, breaking his will so much in the first round that the takedown came kind of easy. He steamrolled him to the ground and picked up right where he left off. Tons of ground and pound, and gets the submission. Little bit controversial. There was one tap from Vyacheslav, but because it was such a dominant round, the referee was just always looking for a moment to step in, and he did have like one big tap. He didn't tap multiple times, but you know, I thought that he was tapping when he just did the one tap. He started complaining, but either way, clean win for Chase Hooper. Gets the submission. Basically like a ground and pound finish as far as I'm concerned. But either way, gets the submission and you got to start thinking of Chase Hooper as someone that can make a title run or at least a run at the rankings. Because even though people clown him and people call him a jiu-jitsu nerd and fair enough, it's a funny meme. He doesn't look very tough. He looks like he has the tofu physique. It doesn't matter because Chase Hooper is one of the most dangerous grapplers in the sport and his striking is improving. And now you have to worry about that too. It kind of reminded me of Bryce Mitchell dropping Edson Barboza in their fight and then going on to dominate him. Since then, Mitchell hasn't really shown that he's that dangerous on the feet. So we may look back at this and this could be like the one knockdown that Chase Super has, but still, he's only 25. His striking is improving. At 155, he's a completely different beast. He's bringing that featherweight skill with him. And I've never seen anyone do this to Vyacheslav Borshev. Fair enough, Borshev hasn't necessarily grappled 
that much in the UFC, but Nazim Sadikov took him down, and that, that's a big lightweight, pretty good at wrestling, couldn't come close to doing this much damage on the ground, and couldn't come close to this type of control on the ground. Chase Hooper's jiu-jitsu is masterful. I mean, as soon as he has his opponents on the mat, they start getting up, he instantly reverses the position. It's impossible to get up to your feet if Chase Hooper wants you on the ground, and he's constantly chaining submissions together, actively looking for finishes, landing ground and pound strikes, getting into mount. He's one of the most entertaining grapplers in the UFC. I think the UFC should be careful with how they build him. He's still only 25. You don't want to just throw him to the wolves. But to be fair, this was kind of a, a huge bump up in competition. This was like one of the most dangerous strikers outside of the rankings that you could have given Chase Hooper as a realistic fight. And he passed the test with flying colors. So I say give him someone with some hype. But either way, I'm excited for Chase Hooper's future, and he really is looking like he could make a run at the rankings. I know Bedtime has been comparing him to Charles Oliveira, and I can see it. I can see it. A lot of similarities between their styles and how their careers started, both of them being former featherweights. But anyway, let's get on to the next one. Amazing win for Chase Hooper. And Vyacheslav Borshev just got absolutely steamrolled. A lot of people thought he was going to knock Hooper out, including myself. But let's get on to the next one. Uh, Waldo Cortez, the pipsqueak Acosta, gets knocked out in the first round by Robelis to Spain. Insane dominance from Robelis to Spain. An I'm him moment from Robelis to Spain is what I would be saying if I was in Peaches and Creamville coping. Waldo Cortez Acosta, let me just say this. I have to issue this guy an apology, all right? I've been calling him a pipsqueak. I didn't like what he did to... Andre Arlovsky, he was styling on him, acting like he was whooping his ass, even though it was a razor close fight. But you know what? He styled on Rebellus to Spain. On the feet was beckoning him on to slug. He was pointing down to the canvas in round two. That's how confident he was in his defense not to get KO'd. And I said, if he gets this to the ground, he's going to be able to win. But I just don't see it happening. I don't see Waldo shooting the takedown. He shot the takedown in the first Fought a very high IQ game plan. Basically the only game plan he should have been fighting. And completely fraud checked. Rebellus to Spain. Who had absolutely nothing off of his back. And I know a lot of people are going to say. How the heck can Rebellus not have anything off of his back? Hasn't this guy even been training? I mean you got to think about the same thing for Waldo Cortez Acosta. Waldo Cortez Acosta's whole training camp. Was probably spent on wrestling. He's been in the UFC for longer. He has more wrestling experience. So, like, it's not unfathomable that Waldo, if he could take down Rebellus, could keep him there. Right? And that's exactly what happened. And you know what? I know a lot of people were saying this was a boring performance. But Waldo Cortez Acosta beat the shit out of Rebellus to Spain in the second round. And the third. It looked like we were going to get a TKO stoppage in the third round. Waldo Cortez Acosta was literally beating Rebellus to Spain up. Former Olympic bronze medalist in Taekwondo who was supposed to go out there and smoke him. I thought he was going to smoke him too. So I was dead wrong. But you had Waldo Cortez Acosta not only landing consistent ground and pound strikes, but also looking to the crowd and yelling, I am the champion over and over and over again. Like Habib Nurmagomedov to Michael Johnson. Insane dominance from Robelis to Spain. An I'm him moment from Robelis to Spain. And I got it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, uh, from Waldo Cortez Acosta. I, I can't believe he actually won. Waldo Cortez Acosta is him. And he can do all the freaking emoting he wants, bro. Because the thing is, fair enough, we didn't like him emoting on Andre Arlovsky because he's a UFC legend and it was a close fight. And it's crazy how Andre Arlovsky gave him a tougher fight. But either way, if you can emote on Rebellus to Spain, who's supposed to knock your head off, then you can emote against anyone. And he has the right to do it now. Again, a lot of people were saying that this was a boring fight, but I thought it was entertaining on the ground, even though Rebellus was losing and I was upset that my pick was wrong. Waldo Cortez Acosta was beating his ass. And as far as Rebellus to Spain, we learned a lot. We learned that he's probably not going to be able to steamroll people outside of the rankings if they can shoot a takedown. And he's got absolutely nothing off of his back. And if he were to fight someone in the rankings, he probably gets destroyed against anyone that can shoot takedowns, especially if they're known for grappling. Waldo got close to a Kimura in the first round. Imagine if someone like Aspinall were to have taken him down. Or imagine if someone like Almeida or the Blob would be able to take him down. And either way, 
I was still kind of underwhelmed by the striking of Robelis to Spain. I expected, because, you know, this is a Olympic Taekwondo athlete that won a bronze medal that is 6'7", that has the longest reach in UFC history, one-shot knockout power. You'd expect a little bit more dominance on the feet, even though Waldo Cortez Acosta has got experience and he's fast and he's tricky. You would expect an Olympic Taekwondo guy that is someone with the build of Rebellus to Spain to be able to be a little bit more dominant on the feet. To be able to have a little bit more of a skill gap or maybe we would see some flying knees or some some creative setups or whatever but it's not kickboxing i guess and i guess just uh thinking about guys like mvp or wonder boy with the karate and then you have um yaya rodriguez with taekwondo and we know yaya rodriguez is one of the best offensive strikers in mma i just expected a little bit better I thought that, you know, if we see more minutes of Robelis in the octagon, we'll see creative setups and all this stuff, but he really didn't look that good. Like, he looked decent. He was outstriking Waldo Cortez in the second and third round on the feet, as long as it was on the feet, but it wasn't this type of dominant display I expected to see on the feet. And uh, whenever Robelis took him, or I'm sorry, whenever Waldo took him down, he easily outgrappled him and landed a lot of damaging strikes. I thought it was a good performance from him, and I didn't think it was boring at all. But yeah, serious fraud check for Rebellus to Spain. And credit to everyone that picked Waldo Cortez Acosta, because he did have a lot... You know what? The odds were pretty close for this fight. And that is interesting if you think about it. The odds were incredibly close, but it felt like Rebellus to Spain should have been like a minus. I mean, in hindsight, he shouldn't have been. A huge favorite but either way before the fight it felt like this was a a lamb being led to the slaughter in waldo cortez acosta but he pulls it off and respect to him let's get on to the next one alex caceres versus sean woodson i picked sean woodson to win this by decision i said he was going to be a little bit too awkward and he's too long to deal with on the feet and that's kind of what happened although some people were saying Caceres won. I think the judges gave this 30-27 to Woodson. Definitely not. I mean, Woodson was actually getting beat in the third round. Was easily getting outstruck. Credit to Caceres after losing the first two rounds because he really went out there and posed his will and let go of the kitchen sink and just took it to Woodson. Did not care about getting finished and lit him up and he should have been given that round. But I do think the judges rewarded the rightful winner. I do think that Sean Woodson slightly outstruck Caceres in the second round, and he slightly outstruck Caceres in the first round. And you know what? Close fight. It's not like Woodson's been dominating people, but if you look at his record, he actually has one of the most impressive unranked resumes in the UFC. He's beaten Caceres. He's beaten Charles Jordan. He's beaten Yusuf Salal. There are a couple other guys that I'm forgetting about, but Sean Woodson has only one L. I think it's to, um, what is it? Who's, who's he lost to? I'm forgetting the guy that he lost to. Maybe Julian Arosa. But either way, only one L in the UFC. A bunch of good wins. I think it's time that we give Sean Woodson a ranked opponent. And I want to see him fight someone that can wrestle. I think he called out Bryce Mitchell, which I think would be a really good fight. And that would be like the perfect test for the takedown defense of Sean Woodson. He's impossible to take down. And, uh, you know, he's looks like he's a pushover because he's built like a freaking twig or a toothpick. But it'd be a good test. I want to see if Bryce Mitchell can take him down because we know Mitchell has really good wrestling, amazing grappling. But if Mitchell can't, that's going to be a tough one for him. And Woodson has some really good knees up the middle. So that could be a dangerous fight for both guys. But let's get on to the next one. Another fraud check. This was the last fight that I picked wrong on the card. Mateus Rebecki gets TKO'd in the third round by short notice, crafty vet, Carlos Diego Fajeda. You know what? As soon as this fight started, I, I, I was saying to my chat, Rebecki looks open on the feet. He's slugging for the fences. This is not the Rebecki that I expected, right? And we learned a lot. Rebecki was straight up spamming overhands over and over and over again not low kicking i think he had one moment in the second round where he threw two low kicks and he dropped diego fajeda and i was saying like why doesn't he just go back to the low kicks why doesn't he fight more efficiently because he's so powerful if he can pick his shots 
he'll do a lot of damage and he'll have bigger moments. And yeah, he got the knockdown in the first round because these guys were slugging and Rebecca got the knockdown at the end of it and he stole the round. But Carlos Diego Fajeda on short notice stayed more composed, picked his shots and didn't put everything into his strikes and was just flowing with the straight shots. Body kicks, teeps up the middle, one twos, jabs, like his jab looked really good in this fight and he just started beating the shit out of Mateus Rebecki who gassed himself out in the second round because he was just spamming overhands over and over and over again. No pun intended, but he was literally spamming them. And you can hear him, it was he was doing the gagey grunt. You could hear him throwing everything into these punches. And you could just see him draining his gas tank with every single one of the overhands that he was throwing. And he just didn't fight efficiently. And by the end of the second round, both of his eyes were bubbled up because Carlos Diego Fajardo was lighting this man up, just picking his shots. Again, not putting everything into them, trusting in himself, trusting in his uh, long rangey one twos. And yeah, Rebecca would get a takedown every now and then, but because Carlos Diego Fajardo is so good on the ground, he would eventually work his way into top position or he would reverse the position. And then in the third round, it was utter dominance. Rebecca was getting teed off on. He had emptied his gas tank too much to be able to change the tide. And towards the end of the third round, we saw Carlos Diego Feira get an upper hand position on the ground. He reversed a position, got into mount, and then just started pounding away with ground and pound on Mateus Rebecca, TKOing him in the last 10 seconds. And he deserved the TKO because it was getting pretty ugly with the damage that was happening on Rebecca's face. So. Amazing win for Carlos Diego Fajeda. Honestly, this might be the best he's ever looked on short notice. Now, fair enough, he was fighting someone that wasn't really fighting that smart and was gassed out in front of him. But either way, just his striking in general, how clean it looked, how well he was putting everything together. I think this is the most impressive he's looked on the feet. And this was another fraud check. A lot of people, including myself, have been hyping up Mateus Rebecca for a long time. And we've been saying this guy's like the real Gamrot. Right, he's got power in his hands, he's got submissions, he's got ground and pound, and he's a smart fighter, and he might have T-Rex arms, he has a 66 inch reach, but he knows how to use it because he backs people up against the fence and he hammers them with low kicks, but where were the low kicks? They weren't there. And I think that maybe I gave him too much credit for being like a very smart fighter with like a really good systematic approach to his fights where Maybe in hindsight, it's more clear that he just kind of goes out there and tries to bulldoze people. And he couldn't bulldoze Diego Fajeda. Maybe he thought that if he could drag Fajeda into a war early because he's on short notice, he would gas out. But it was the other way around. He gassed himself out and just didn't fight the smart game plan. And just, uh, again, it was the spamming of overhands in the second round that kind of fucked him up in the end. And it was an amazing win for Diego Fajeda. Rebecca, 31 years old, losing to a 39-year-old. And even if Rebecca can come back and get a couple of good wins, it's just not a good look. Either way, Menefield versus Olberg. Not a whole lot to take away here. Carlos Olberg got bum-rushed in the first round by Menefield, who landed a big overhand. Carlos Olberg was able to get the better of this exchange and ended up landing a solid left hook on the chin of Menefield in the first 30 seconds to put his lights out. We know the left hook of Carlos Olberg is one of the best left hooks in the upper weight classes. He's the higher level fighter. He could see things a little bit better in the pocket, but you know what? Menafield went after the finish, tried to get the bonus, got the shit end of the stick and live by the sword, die by the sword approach. He gets flatlined in the first round. Good KO for Olberg. Again, we can't really look too deeply into this. I guess you got to give Olberg someone close to the top 10. Maybe Olberg versus Anthony Smith. That could be the fight to make. But I kind of like the idea of Anthony Smith maybe getting like a number one contenders fight. I know people won't necessarily like that. But because there's a storyline with Smith and Alex Pereira, I don't think that's the worst idea. And Pereira has been asking for it. But either way, if, if that's not going to happen, I say Anthony Smith versus Carlos Olberg is a good fight to make. Again, not a whole lot to take away from that. So let's get on to the co-main event. Buck gets it done. Joaquin Buckley. Gets it done over Ruzi Boyev. I picked him to win this fight by a late round stoppage or a decision. It looked like he was going to get the stoppage in the third round, but I honestly thought that Buckley had the best approach to this fight. He took a very measured approach 
right? The size difference between these guys was stark. It was crazy. And Buckley had said he did a lot of training at the uh, St. Louis Boxing Club where he worked with a lot of guys with long reaches and height advantages. And it showed. His defense looked amazing. I know Buckley always has good head movement, but in general, he was seeing a lot of the shots that were coming in his direction. And Ruzi Boyev is extremely fast. I mean, his right hand is incredibly fast. And Buckley just, just avoided it really well in the first two rounds. The difference, because they weren't really doing a whole lot. The first two rounds, it seemed like both guys, for Buckley, it looked like he was doing everything in his power not to get hit at the end of Ruzi Boyev's punches, not to get caught. For Ruzi Boyev, it looked like he was taking the approach of, I don't want to gas out. I don't want to let my hands go and go for this finish to where I, I'm gassed in the second and third. So that's why I believe he was kind of fighting a reserved fight as well. Both guys not really doing a whole lot of anything on the feet, but Ruzi Boyev would throw these flying knees and Buckley would meet him head on and get these really good double legs and he would take him down. And that was the difference in the first two rounds. Buckley with the wrestling, which I said was gonna be some sort of a difference maker in this fight because he has the option to get the takedowns. He has underrated takedowns. He might not have the best ground game, but in general, he can take people down. He's athletic. He has good entries. He took down Ruzi Boyev multiple times in the first three rounds. I believe he went 100% on his takedown accuracy in this fight. And so I think that because not a lot was happening in the first two rounds, the judges just gave those rounds to Buckley, um, even though he didn't really land a lot of damage. Third round, though, Buckley, probably up 2-0, rocks Ruzi Boyev badly, sits him down, drops him and 10 eights him and beats the absolute dog shit out of Ruzi Boyev. And uh, basically had the most dominant round you could have possibly imagined. At one moment, Ruzi Boyev reversed the position, but then Buckley got on top of him again. Didn't get the finish, but either way, uh, Buckley gets it done. Clean sweep, 3-0 with a 10-8 round in the third against a, a really dangerous opponent. And fair enough, Ruzi Boyev, he has nine losses now, and he's basically lost every single one of his fights at welterweight. But this was a tough matchup stylistically. And this was a risky matchup for Buckley. He did not have to take this fight. He just got his ranked position against Vicente Luque. And he's fighting a relatively unknown guy with like two fights in the UFC. As I said, very risky for Joaquin Buckley to get this opponent. But he wanted to fight in his hometown, and he gets it done. And he wins every single round, mixes in the takedown improved defense, good approach to the fight, started letting his hands go a lot more in the third round, got the knockdown and just beat the shit out of Ruzi Boyev, emptied the gas tank, gets on the mic, calls out Conor McGregor. I don't know if that fight's gonna happen because McGregor, I mean, if he loses to Chandler, we're not gonna see his face for like three or four years. But, you know, Buckley has some motion now. Buckley is probably the, the biggest he's ever been. And he's getting a big following. He's been marketing himself a lot on Instagram. And again, getting a big win. This was arguably like the people's main event right here because Buckley's like the hometown guy. Getting this win as a co-main event on a big fight night is big for him. So, I mean, I won't be surprised if we see Conor McGregor clown him tomorrow and at least entertain this matchup, but I don't think that fight's ever going to happen. Either way, maybe you could make Buckley versus Sean Brady because Brady is boys with Ruzi Boyev. And apparently he doesn't like Joaquin Buckley, so you could always make that fight too. But an amazing win for Buckley. And people got to stop sleeping on him, man. People got to stop sleeping on him. I was saying, there's something in the air. And while we were seeing all these upsets, Cortez Acosta beating to Spain, Ferreira beating Rebecca, I just had a feeling. Hooper beating uh, Borshev, I had a feeling we were going to see Buckley get it done. And uh, that's part of why I picked him to win this, all right? A big part of it was Ruzi Boyev just didn't have a lot of experience in the later rounds. And every single one of his finishes comes from the first. And Buckley has a whole lot more experience. But a part of it was, I just think it's time. I think the stars are aligning this year for Joaquin Buckley. And I could just see him pulling it off in his hometown because he has the plot armor. You know, he's got the momentum. So an amazing win for Joaquin Buckley. He's turning into a fan favorite. Derek Lewis and Rodrigo Nascimento. We saw five sets of tomfoolery from Derek Lewis. Uh, he said he was going to go out there and do something crazy that his coaches wouldn't condone. And I guess that was shooting takedowns early because that's what he went out there trying to do. The first thing Derek Lewis does is he shoots a takedown. He doesn't get it. 
Nascimento takes him down at the end of the first. As I said, five rounds or five sets of tomfoolery for Derek Lewis. And then, of course, third round, he decides to throw a one-two. Blinds Rodrigo Nascimento with the jab. Comes over the top with the overhand. Lands clean. And if Derek Lewis lands a flush shot on you, you're basically going down. Derek Lewis gets his 15th KO in the UFC. He is now the all-time leader in knockouts. By two KOs, he is two ahead of Matt Brown, who also had like a big moment. I, I forget what they did with Matt Brown. Maybe they inducted him into the Hall of Fame. Or maybe they just gave him some credit because he retired this week. But Derek Lewis is now at number 15. And what I mean by uh, tomfoolery, it always seems like Derek Lewis, like most of the fights that he's lost, I feel like they've been winnable matchups where he's entertaining the clinch too much. Or on the feet, he's too patient and he's throwing the wrong shots. He doesn't have the best shot selection. But as soon as he lets go like a one-two, just a simple right hand, and he just repeatedly does that, eventually he's going to get the KO. And that's what we saw. Credit the, Nassim, uh, credit the Nascimento because he was trying to fight for his freedom tonight. And uh, it, it's a tough one because he's going to have to go back to the apex. But not so bad that they get a they get a bowl of porridge and they get some stew so it's not the worst they get an hour outside every single day right to kind of warm up the bolts so at least nascimento is going to go back to a nice bowl of stew and derek lewis puts him back in his place i think he got on the mic after after he took his pants off and threw his freaking cup in the crowd he said he wasn't going to lose to a taxi driver which is uh pretty crazy derek lewis always clowns his opponents after he beats them which is pretty hilarious but um, either way, Derek Lewis gets it done with another funny Derek Lewis performance where he was entertaining the grappling too much. Rodrigo took him down a couple times, but again, Derek Lewis has the magical power to just be able to get up or survive. He's un TKOable on the ground. And if you can't sub him, it's just a matter of time before Derek Lewis knocks you out. As soon as he stops messing around, Derek Lewis can put you away. A lot of fraud checks. Overall, a really good fight night. I enjoyed this card. I thought this was one of the best fight nights of the year. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know what you think in the comments. Until next time. Hooper's got to really put some pressure on him to get that takedown. Borshev, watch Borshev's uppercuts. He's got some of the cleanest uppercuts in the lightweight. Oh! Hit! Chase Hooper dropped him! Oh my god! Chase Hooper just dropped Borshev! And he's going to stop him. He's got the body triangle. First round, Hooper drops Borshev. That's insane. He's in mount. Hooper's in mount. He's going to finish him. No way. Chase Hooper's going to fucking destroy him. You don't want to get hit at the end of one of these combinations. But Ruzi Boyev is now actually looking to be gassing a little bit. Good body shots there from Buckley. Flying knee. For oh, Ruzi Boyev's looking tired. Oh, and there he's starting to break. Nice teeps from Ruzi Boyev. He's not actually breaking, but... Two teeps in a row from Ruzi Boyev looking good. Damn! Did he knock him down? No, he didn't knock him down. He just slipped, but Buckley got on top of him. Buckley is on top of Ruzi Boyev. Landing punches. He's in mount. Damn, he's beating him up bad. Two minutes and 22 seconds on the clock. Buckley's standing on business. Buckley, Buckley, Buckley. Damn, he's slamming his head on the canvas. Oh! He's got him hurt. People forget, man. Yes! Yes! Buckley gets it done! 10-8 round for Buckley. Woo! You could just sit behind a jab and low kicks and just tee off on your opponent and, and stay out of range. You don't have to commit too much to those. So you don't have to leave yourself up. Oh! Oh! Joe! Holy shit, he's out! Holy shit! Holy shit! Holy shit! Terrence McKinney just got, oh my gosh. Terrence McKinney just got fucking head kick KO'd with one head kick. That was brutal. Terrence McKinney. Damn, bro. That's my first pick wrong tonight. Wow. McKinney gets caught with a head kick. Slumped out cold. Oh my God, that was a good kick. Can I even call him Chinny? I don't think I could call him Chinny. That's a legit, like, perfectly placed high kick. Beautiful setup. 